So, before the first talk, just a few welcoming words. So I welcome you, my name is Alexandre Gay, to the fourth All of Us workshop. All of Us is what we call in Belgium a uh, group de contact, which is a, 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 an instrument, financing instrument, to favor collaboration among Belgian people, but not Flanders. <laughs> You should, you should have seen me on the phone with the FNRS in Brussels to say, can I pay the train ticket from people, a person from Ghent? No. Can I pay a train ticket from people from Paris? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and on the phone, because it should not be written anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so the other first, but the, particular, the other first group, the contact is mostly, we mostly promote research on, on ontology and uh, with the sensibility to linguistic also, language. So this, this year the team is from science to metaphysics and really important, there's a question mark. So we, we welcome people that disagree with the, the, main, the mainstream, but we also welcome people in the mainstream. We're Belgium. We, Belgian people know how to accommodate divergence. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I have to say that uh, I'm very happy of the program because we received an abnormal high number of submissions for this workshop, and it was a very difficult decision to choose uh, to, to cut very good, good potential abstract because we wanted at least that people had at, mo at least 30 minutes to present their basic ideas. 20 minutes is often too, too, too short. Usually we, we, we hope to have more, but there was too many good abstract. By default, if you don't say you disagree, the, your talk will be streamed on YouTube at the same time. Of course, if you disagree, Please tell us. Tell, before. tell me especially. <laughs> before. Also, you you should all fill during the day this uh, sheet with the name, institution, if you have an institution, country, blah, 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 for the Belgium financing Maybe agency you know. that wants to know in details who is coming to the talk in case a member of parliament complain about why should we <laughs> finance philosophy of science? <laughs> and we can tell them there's people coming from blah, blah, blah. Uh, next thing, you have seen tomorrow, and I, I say that tomorrow afternoon, is student presentation. So uh, usually in the other of us, we try to include student, master student. Most of them, it will be the first research presentation in their life. And I'm telling you right now, I will not tolerate bullying. <laughs> People that are nasty. You know, I've been trained in the United States. So <laughs> <laughs> People that are nasty. These people are, we, have, we should be welcoming to new people in our field as much as possible. Of course, you can disagree with them and explain <laughs> why you disagree. I hope many of you will still be available tomorrow afternoon. I don't know about train tickets and, and, and this. And for those interested, uh, we, uh, we will have sandwiches in, in, for the lunch in case some of you want to continue to discuss. Of course, you're free also to, to use the different uh, restaurants of Louvain-la-Neuve, if you wish. And I did not <coughs> schedule a formal banquet or something like that, but there could be, depending of uh, affinity during the day, organization that we can, we finish early enough to organize something <coughs> in the afternoon. If you have any questions, any difficulties, anything, please ask me whatever you want. We tried this configuration this morning. If you, if you people guys are too far from the screen, in, during the, the, the break, we can change the configuration of the room. So now I leave, I leave the rest in the hand of Charles Pence, who will preside for a session. Yeah, so I'm chairing. Um, this is easy, though. Um, chairing, one, chairing one talk by, by someone like Anjan is not exactly a, not exactly a, hard, a hard piece of work. Um, so yes, it is my distinct honor and privilege to, uh, to, to welcome our first of, of two keynote speakers. So we'll have another uh, tomorrow morning as well. Online. Um, online, yes, unfortunately. Unfortunately, uh, uh, remotely, uh, remoting in. 
Uh, but our first keynote speaker is Anjan Chakravarty. He's coming to us from the uh, uh, University <coughs> of Miami. Um, well, it would take me too long to enumerate um, excellent publications and uh, professional qualifications. So what I'll instead say briefly is, uh, I feel like probably if you're in this room uh, thinking about a conference with the conference title, From Science to Metaphysics? Question mark. I don't actually need to introduce Anjan. You know who this is. Um, his work now for uh, a good uh, a good 15 years has been at the forefront of exactly this, this kind of thing. Um, I have learned much from him personally over the years, and so it's a distinct pleasure to see what he's up to these days. So without further ado, please uh, take it away. Thanks a lot, Charles. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's, uh, it's been a long time since I've been in Leuven le Neuf. In fact, I looked it up. <laughs> it was 12 years ago, uh, I was here for something very unusual, I think, in our field. I was here for a debate with Stathis Silos uh, on laws of nature. Stathis was defending a Humean account of laws, I was defending a non-Humean account of laws. We gave papers, it was organized by Michel Gens uh, as part of a larger series of debates. Uh, I think Bernard Feltz was involved and, and various other people. Uh, really a lot of fun, it was fantastic. But that was 12 years ago. So, you know, as time goes by, these things become increasingly precious memories. So, uh, I wanted to express my thanks to Michelle, but also, of course, to Alexandre and uh, the current team here at UCL for this really nice invitation. Uh, I'm delighted to be back, and also with a number of old friends. So, I don't know whether everybody back there can see I think I can see just about everyone. If you can't hear me at any point, just wave. Everybody can see the screen, I hope. Okay, good. So, as some of you know, I've been interested in debates about scientific realism and anti-realism for uh, quite a long time now. Thanks, Charles, for reminding me <laughs> how long it's been. Um, but in my last book, which was called Scientific Ontology, I was keen to focus on uh, what I take to be some deeper philosophical, actually metaphilosophical issues that underpin debates about realism. And as it happens, uh, these issues are all about the theme for this conference, right? From science to metaphysics. Because they concern the question of how and to what extent empirical science can serve as a basis for theorizing about the ontology of the world. So what I'd like to do today is to briefly introduce you to uh, some of those ideas. And then, since the book has been out for a little while now, I want to consider some challenges that have emerged since uh, in response. <laughs> and I do all of this with apologies to Sam, who uh, <laughs> heard not all, but part of this, you know, an overlapping part of this uh, at a conference in Berlin not so long ago. All right, so here's what's on the menu for today. First, I want to start by talking just a little bit about how I see the evolution of debates about scientific realism and anti-realism <clears throat> over the last few decades. I think the debate has shifted in some interesting ways that are actually relevant and probably important for us to consider if we're thinking about questions of how to move from science to metaphysics. After that, I want to give you just a little snapshot, a precy of some of the things that I've said about what I will more generically call scientific ontology and spell out in not a lot of detail, but just to give you the gist of it, um, how I think about this in terms of the role played by underlying epistemic stances in determining how we think about scientific ontology. And then for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about a couple of objections that have emerged since. One of them has to do with what is perhaps the most controversial part of the picture that I suggest, which ultimately claims that there are, in fact, different ways we might think about scientific ontology, different and conflicting ways we might think about scientific ontology, uh, and that more than one of these possibilities is likely rational. 
other words, there are likely rationally defensible takes on scientific ontology that we might take, and we need not agree with one another other necessarily about how far we can go into metaphysics from science. And there are some people who I think understandably worry about this. Some people think, no, there really should be some sort of rational obligation or rational requirement to believe what we believe about scientific ontology. And so I want to consider a particular objection to that effect in uh, section three. And then finally, in section four, I want to talk about something that's related, uh, and that is the idea that once we have a permissive enough conception of rationality that allows for the idea that we might think differently about how far we can go into metaphysics from science, uh, and that that's okay from a rational point of view, that this actually opens the door to all kinds of worrying things. It opens the door to pseudoscience, it opens the door to pretend science, to various forces of science denialism, and that that's obviously a bad thing. And so I'll end by talking a little bit about that concern about the project as well. All right, so that's the, the menu. Let's get stuck in. So to begin, what's at issue between realists and anti-realists? Well, as you know, what's at issue is nothing less than the most important, the most central question in our field, namely, how should we interpret our best science? Right? What details uh, uh, and beliefs are warranted by it? What knowledge does it yield? At a certain level of abstraction, everybody knows that realism is the idea that our best theories and models uh, are epistemically impressive, uh, and increasingly so over time. They yield truths or something close by about both observable and unobservable aspects of the world. Their central terms refer successfully to things in the world, and so on. Anti-realism is any sort of denial of realism thus broadly construed. In the recent history of philosophy of science, debates about realism and anti-realism were typically carried out almost exclusively at that level of abstraction. Um, so many of you will be familiar with the the early heyday of these discussions in the 1970s and the 1980s. Since then, though, I think that discussions have become more nuanced and more refined in ways that are important for us to take into account. So let me just skate over this briefly, because I think it provides a motivation for what I want to say about how we go from empirical science to ontology or to metaphysics more broadly. Oh, by the way, I should just mention that a moment ago I described what's at stake in terms of both warranted belief and also knowledge. Right? I did that just to be inclusive because uh, different people prefer to talk one way or the other. But for the sake of simplicity, uh, I'm just going to talk about beliefs for the rest of today. So if you prefer, you can translate that into talk about knowledge in your heads if you like. Right? I'm happy either way. So here are just a couple of examples of what I'm describing as more refined discussions in the recent evolution of debates about realism. So first, in the relatively recent past, there's been a much greater focus on philosophy of science in practice. So thinking about, for example, specific techniques of abstraction, of idealization, of approximation. And it's not always clear whether or how particular aspects of theories and models can be regarded as true or approximately true. So the moral I take from this is that the relevant unit of analysis here is generally going to be much smaller than talk of models and theories Simpliciter would suggest. So I think that's one way in which discussions of realism have become more refined. People are paying more and closer attention to particular aspects of theories rather than treating theories as a whole as the right, the correct unit of analysis for thinking about these issues. The second thing uh, that I wanted to flag is the idea that there's been a diversification of more or less selective forms of realism. So for example, entity realism, <laughs> that's focusing on a very particular aspect of theories. Structural realism, that's suggesting that we should be realists about certain structural features of our best science. Uh, Semi-realism was the view that I argued for uh, back in the day. 
That's a, a realism about well-detected properties in the first instance. And then we can build up our conceptions of objects and structures, entities and so on from there. All of these are selective in the sense that they don't take theories as the right unit of analysis, but they take some particular thing about theories as being uh, what's most defensibly endorsable in a realist way. A lot of this is in response to the pessimistic induction, right? So the idea that our, the history of science has shown that uh, what we believe today is unlikely, what we will believe 50 years from now or 100 years from now, and so we need to be more refined, so a lot of these more selective people think, about what it is in particular that we think will last uh, past the test of time. Another motivation, I think, is just wanting to do justice to the idiosyncratic differences uh, between different subject matters and subdisciplines in the sciences. I don't think it makes sense to think that we should have one, you know, one size fits all attitude towards how we should think about the ontology of our theories. If you can't hear me at the back over this at any point, just wait. If you have to yeah, speak a bit louder, like, okay. This is part of the Belgian experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so sad. <laughs> Do right. that again next time. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the moral of this greater selectivity, I take it, is that, again, the relevant unit of analysis is often described here in terms of increasingly metaphysical proposals for what we should be realists about exactly. So if we're going to be entity realists, what are entities exactly? And what sorts of descriptions do we think <laughs> we need in order to successfully refer to them? Or if you're going to be a structural realist, uh, as many of you will know, there are huge debates on what the metaphysics of structure is such that we can be realists about it. Or if you're a semi-realist, what are properties, what are their relations, and how should we think about their relation to thing like, things like laws of nature and so on. Right. So with this greater selectivity comes, I think, a greater focus on certain metaphysical issues that are required to actually just articulate what it is that we're being realists about. And all of this motivates, I suggest, a different way of thinking, a more fine-grained way of thinking about what's going on in disputes between realists about, and anti-realists about science. So let me turn to that now. So as I just mentioned, the morals that I want to take seriously here are that the relevant units of analysis are more focused than theories and models simpliciter, and that in order to articulate realist commitments so that we know what we're talking about in these debates, we're going to have to do at least some metaphysics. So let me introduce the term scientific ontology just to label this finer grained approach. Ontology, of course, is the a uh, branch of philosophy that's concerned with questions regarding what things and what types of things exist and what those things are like. In other words, you know, what properties they have, how they relate to one another, if at all, what we usually characterize in terms of laws and principles. Scientific ontology, then, is simply the ontology of the world as revealed by our best science. I'm thinking about this in a more fine-grained way than traditional thinking about realism uh, may allow, I think, uh, manifests itself in at least a couple of different ways. Right? So for one thing, it allows for discriminations between what we should believe and what we shouldn't that cut across what were previously characterized more coarsely as forms of realism or anti-realism. So you know, just for example, um, consider some uh, more traditional versus more uh, contemporary forms of instrumentalism. So for those of you who are familiar with this work, I'm thinking of people like Kyle Stanford or Daryl Robotto. Um, these more uh, contemporary forms of instrumentalism, uh, they're, they're actually realist about some unobservables, and they're not about others. So they characterize their instrumentalism in a way that actually cuts across the categories of realism and anti-realism as they were traditionally conceived. Um, and that's true of realism as well. So as realism has become more selective, it's become more skeptical about things that don't fall under the remit of what selective realists think we should be realists about. <coughs> so that's one way in which uh, it manifests. Another way, I think, 
is that it allows for more fine-grained discriminations within the traditional categories of realism. Um, so I've just mentioned the idea that some realists are more fulsome in what they think we can endorse, and others are more selective. It goes without saying, but I think I should just highlight this because it will become important later. It goes without saying that these debates about scientific ontology are engaged by people who are all champions of science, right? I mean, none of them are science denialists, uh, you know, like vaccine skeptics or flat earthers. Right? What they contest is how far we should go in interpreting our best science as giving something like true descriptions of the world. So what limits, for example, might there be on scientific or naturalized metaphysics or the metaphysics of science such that it's distinct from some other kinds of metaphysical projects? Well, let me feature two features of, let me flag two features of scientific ontology that I think are crucial to understanding how we might conceive of those limits and thus show how different <coughs> agents come to hold different beliefs about the epistemic upshot of any given part of science. So the first has to do with uh, what I call assessments of epistemic risk, which concerns how confident we are in judging an ontological claim to be true or false. So if you think the claim that there is dark matter is especially epistemically risky, good luck. <laughs> I'm very sensitive to this at the moment because we're doing some renovations in our house. So there are, there are people like bashing walls and like drilling things all over the place. And so I'm used to it. I might not even notice it. <laughs> Just, yeah. All right, so if you think that the claim that there is dark matter is especially epistemically risky, that means you don't feel confident in assessing the truth value of that claim. Uh, perhaps you'd feel more comfortable just suspending judgment and remaining agnostic instead. On the other hand, if you view the claim as not being especially epistemically risky, that means you have confidence in your ability to judge based on the evidence that you have. Right? So that's what I mean by epistemic risk. The second feature of scientific ontology that I wanted to flag concerns how, in any given case, assessments of risk are made. So one crucial factor is what I'm going to call empirical vulnerability. That's just a measure of the susceptibility of a hypothesis or a claim or a theory mm -hmm. to confirmation on the basis of our empirical evidence. Another uh, desideratum, or at least factor, is explanatory power. Explanatory power is a measure of the quality of the explanation furnished by a hypothesis, a theory, um, of other things that we may want to know uh, or understand better. So quality here is assessed contextually, right? but it's typically informed by virtues that I think will sound familiar to all of you, right? Things like consistency, coherence with our background knowledge, maybe possible unification, and so on, right? All of the sorts of things that we think make an explanation compelling. Here's the thing, though. Empirical vulnerability and explanatory power both admit of degrees. And I think there's a serious question here, a question that looms large for any vaguely naturalistic you know, deference to science as a source of warranted beliefs regarding how empirically vulnerable an ontological claim needs to be or how compelling an explanation needs to be in order to lower epistemic risk sufficiently to warrant belief. In fact, different perceptions of epistemic risk are precisely what's at stake in debates about scientific ontology. And this brings me to the idea of epistemic stances. <laughs> so a stance is something that underwrites our judgments about um, how far we should go along the spectrum of epistemic risk in making ontological claims. So I mentioned my position before. In the realism debate, it's a realism about well-detected properties. But then, of course, we can always ask further questions. What are these properties? Are they categorical properties? Are they, in some sense, modal properties, right? Are they propensities in quantum mechanics? Or are they uh, dispositions in chemistry? What are these properties? What are the natures of these properties? Right? That's a further question one might ask. And then one might ask a, a question beyond that. Given if they are modal in some sense, 
Uh, what is their relationship to laws of nature? Do we even need laws of nature? Right? Are laws of nature just ways of talking about the modal natures of properties? And then you can ask further questions. And of course, I'm not going to iterate all of the questions that one might ask, but the idea is that the more and more you ask, and the deeper and deeper the metaphysical account you give of the thing that you began with, which was just scientifically well-detected properties, the further you're moving along what I'm calling a kind of spectrum of epistemic risk. You're going deeper and deeper into the metaphysical analysis of the thing you began with, which were scientifically well-detected properties. <coughs> So, an epistemic stance is something that uh, underwrites our judgments about how far we should go along this spectrum of epistemic risk. It shapes our interpretations of the epistemic upshot of our best science. And I think perhaps the best way to introduce this idea is just to contrast stances with propositions or claims about matters of fact. So, um, here's a claim. Levin Leneuve has a larger population than Brussels. <laughs> That's a claim. Um, Alexandra has two children. I mean, these are claims about putative matters of fact, right? whether they're true or false. A stance, on the other hand, isn't a claim about the world. It isn't propositional as such. Rather, it's an orientation. It's a, a cluster of values, attitudes, and commitments that incorporate strategies that are relevant to the production of factual beliefs, or at least putatively factual beliefs such as those expressed in claims about ontology. So a stance isn't something that's believed as such. Rather, it's something that's adopted and exemplified in attempts to produce knowledge. In shaping the ways that we uh, interpret the outputs of scientific work, stances inform assessments about uh, um, whether a claim that something exists is supported by empirical investigation, or whether, say, the explanatory power associated with a hypothesis uh, is something that um, you know, supports the claim that something exists, and so on. So the primary function of, st of a stance is to determine where an epistemic agent draws lines between domains of theorizing, right, domains of inquiry, uh, theorizing about laws of nature, theorizing about the metaphysics of structure. Uh, drawing lines between domains which, in which belief seems appropriate and domains in which it seems as though, well, you know, it's probably better just to suspend belief or remain agnostic there. The evidence isn't sufficiently compelling. Now, one of the key ingredients of an epistemic stance is a kind of set of guidelines, something like a collection of instructions or policies for how to behave epistemically. So just to give you the basic idea of what I have in mind, let me contrast the epistemic policies that seem to underwrite um, many of the debates that I mentioned earlier about realism. So I'm not going to do this justice, but I'm just going to throw up some, what are really caricatures, I think. I mean, for actual people, policies like these will presumably be more nuanced and complex, qualified in various ways. But with that caveat, um, here are some of the core epistemic policies associated with one white call um, the deflationary stance, which underwrites many pragmatist and neo-Kantian views of scientific knowledge. Uh, the empiricist stance, which underwrites many instrumentalist type views. And the metaphysical stance, which underwrites many realist type views. So I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but just to give you the idea. So here are a couple of policies that are often associated with what I'm calling a deflationary stance. One thing that deflationists are unimpressed by are traditional realist um, understandings of scientific ontology. The idea that when what we're doing when we give an ontology is describing um, things that exist in a mind-independent world about which we can successfully make claims. Deflationists are typically concerned about that kind of hubris uh, in their view. A fortiori, they would typically reject analyses of truth truth about mind-independent facts, um, reference with respect to things in a mind-independent reality, in terms of which traditional ontology, by which I mean realist ontology, are, are, are generally understood. The empiricist stance. The empiricist stance, uh, as Van Frossen characterized it, as a perennial uh, rebellion against the excesses of metaphysics. It rejects. <coughs> 
demands for explanation in terms of things underlying the observable. And so a fortiori, uh, it rejects attempts to answer these demands by theorizing about the unobservable. Of course, this has to be understood in a certain way, right? I mean, of course, um, you can accept demands and theorize in a sense, right? What you shouldn't do is take that kind of exercise as something that yields truths about the world that you should believe, <coughs> maybe heuristically or otherwise interesting to do. The metaphysical stance is one that accepts demands for explanation in terms of underlying observable things and attempts to answer those demands by theorizing about the unobservable. So there's much more that can be said about all of this, of course, but with uh, an eye on the clock, uh, let me spend the rest of my time talking about uh, a couple of what I think are quite interesting objections to this way of thinking about ontology. All right. So in some recent work, Chris Pincock, who some of you will know, raises concerns about all of this um, for realism about various aspects of the metaphysics of science. So those of you who are familiar with Pincock's work will know that he's argued for a number of views concerning uh, scientific entities, about a uh, form of structuralism, about laws of nature, and many other things besides. His worry about the picture that I've just sketched concerns the idea that, as I argue in the book, and as I mentioned right off the top, different stances may be rational in the sense of meeting certain minimal conditions of consistency and coherence. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. <laughs> if different stances can be rational, then there's a sense in which we have a kind of choice regarding what stance to adopt, um, which is really just to say that so far as epistemic rationality is concerned, there are different ways one might go. So the idea of choosing one among rational options is uh, familiar, will be familiar to all of you. Uh, it's part of a tradition of voluntarism in epistemology, which suggests that at least in at least some contexts, what we believe is a function of our philosophical temperament or the will. Um, as you know, William James, for instance, argued that there are different paths we might take between the risks of believing too much, thus courting false beliefs, and believing too little, thus missing out on truths, possible true beliefs. Pincock's worry is that if voluntarism is correct, and as a consequence, the ontological commitments he derives from interpreting our best science aren't, in fact, rationally obligatory, that would actually undermine his beliefs. I think this is a very uh, common and understandable reaction. But I also think that it's premised on a couple of misunderstandings. So let me try to explain why that's so. So Pincock offers uh, a couple of arguments. The first one targets voluntarism directly. So here he goes for some big guns right away. He cites Bernard Williams uh, with approval. Right? So this is on the, the slide. Right? If I could acquire a belief at will, it is unclear that I could seriously think of it as a belief as something purporting to represent reality. Now, I think that there's something right about that. I mean, the idea that you might just believe it will uh, in ways that conflict with, say, what's readily apparent to you, say, in perception, um, or in ways that are insulated from an active consideration of the relevant evidence, say, maybe just by you know, flipping a switch, as it were, internally, and thereby changing your doxastic attitude from uh, belief or disbelief or agnosticism, agnosticism to some other attitude just on that basis alone, that does seem problematic. I mean, to do that would be to sever links to evidence that are crucial, presumably, um, to any genuine attempt to represent reality. So I do think that there's something right about this. But what if we were to add evidence back into the equation? Right? Say, scientific evidence of the sort that is taken seriously in all debates about scientific ontology, right? I mean, this is why I was at some pains at the beginning to say all of these people are champions of science. In that case, I think this point is more con uh, contentious. There's a substantive question here as to whether evidence all by itself yields uniquely rational doxastic attitudes towards scientific claims or hypotheses or theories. I mean, just think, for example, 
about uh, debates about the underdetermination of theory by data. Those are in part debates about how far the evidence can carry us uh, in favor of one hypothesis or another. And there are plenty of other debates of that sort. So all of that said though, right, in, in favor of there being a kernel of something right here, I do think that something has gone wrong. More specifically, I think that there's a problematic conflation here between doxastic voluntarism, that is, a direct sort of choice regarding what to believe, and stance voluntarism, which is much more indirectly connected to belief, and as a result, I think it involves a much less contentious sense of choice. So Pincock's examples, sorry guys, you can manage. No, 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 you're good, you're good. So Pincock's examples are all examples of, well, you might believe P or you might believe not P. And the voluntarist says, well, you can believe either one. It's all, you know, it's all rational. Um, as though you might simply choose one or the other. And a lot of the, in analytic epistemology, a lot of the literature on this concerns beliefs of that type. Um, that's doxastic voluntarism. But no, if two people are arguing about P and not P, if they think the evidence is uh, sufficient for us to determine, say, that there are standard model Higgs bosons, or that there aren't standard model Higgs bosons, right, and they're arguing about it, then those people share a stance. Remember, the primary function of a stance is to determine domains of inquiry in which an agent thinks the evidence licenses belief. So people arguing for P versus not P clearly think the evidence licenses belief. What a person holding a different stance, say, in this case, might say, is not P or not P, but they might say, well, I'm agnostic. I don't think the evidence supports belief here at all. So here, there's no question of severing connections to evidence and considerations of evidence. A stance is an orientation involving attitudes and policies that are relevant to assessing evidence. Stances are thus at a kind of remove from or sort of upstream from the doxastic attitudes uh, that we end up forming regarding aspects of theories and models. And choice here, right, the notion of choice inherent in voluntarism here, simply means that there are rationally permissible options among stances, right? Not that you can flip a switch and believe what you like. So I think that we can set Pincock's first objection to one side here. What about his second objection? Well, I think this second one can, in fact, be read in such a way as to target stance volunteerism. So in other words, it presents a challenge that's unaffected by what I've just said in response to his first concern. The basic idea is that if a realist were to view stances that conflict with her own as rationally permissible, that would render her own incoherent and thus indefensible. So as uh, Pincock puts it, right, this is on the slide, voluntarism about stances requires one to admit that there is no reason in favor of one's own stance. By no reason, I mean that there is no rational obligation to adopt that stance. And then from this, he argues uh, that realists such as himself must then you know, take their own stance to be rationally obligatory. And he goes on to argue that you know, given some natural assumptions about connections between explanation and inference, uh, that some sort of realism is in fact required. So let me generalize this worry in a way that I think Pincock would accept, actually, just by parity of reasoning. If he's right about the dire consequences of voluntarism, then no one would have a reason to adopt uh, their own or any other rational stance. Right? I mean, the concern presumably applies across the board because there would be no obligation to go one way or the other. So lacking rational obligations and recognizing the rationality of those with conflicting stances, it would be indefensible, incoherent even, to adopt any such option. And that all sounds very self-defeating for everyone. So I think it's a genuine concern. So I think there is a way of understanding this argument that makes it compelling. But it requires an illicit conflation. Right? Illicit in the sense that it begs the question against stance volunteers. The argument runs together the idea of choosing a rational stance with the idea of choosing a stance that's rationally required. But the very idea that a stance must be rationally obligatory in order to be rationally chosen 
is precisely what stance voluntarism denies. Remember that voluntarism rests on a permissive conception of epistemic rationality, according to which, at least in some cases, different options may be rational and thus permitted. Right? So on this view, rational choice and rational obligation are distinct concepts. Right? They can't be run together. In order to argue in a non-question begging way that only stances underpinning realism are rational, right? so to achieve the kind of uh, requirement or rational obligation that he's looking for, um, one would have to show that alternative stances um, are, in fact, not rational after all. But that would require a compelling argument for a different theory of rationality. And that's actually not an easy thing to do, I think. So Pincock doesn't provide this, and you know, fair enough, yeah, it's a tall order. As I mentioned, his basic idea is that given certain attitudes and epistemic policies regarding demands for explanation, uh, the evidential weight of certain kinds of explanations, you know, once you've taken all that on board, then realism is, use his term, mandatory. But note the conditional nature of that prescription, right? The obligation to draw realist conclusions follows from an adoption of an underlying stance concerning evidence and explanation. So granted, given realist-friendly stances, one ought to believe as realists do, but that has no implication for the rationality of stances generally. Different agents may adopt different but nonetheless rational stances, reflecting the sorts of things that they value epistemically, yielding different combinations of ontological commitments and agnosticism. So let me move on now uh, to one last word about stance voluntarism. So Pincock's strategy for undermining stance voluntarism is direct, right, in the sense that it attempts to demonstrate that there's something wrong with the idea itself. But even if I'm right that his strategy doesn't really work, I think there are also indirect strategies to consider. And perhaps the most striking example of this attempts to go uh, the indirect route um, with arguments to the effect that voluntarism in this arena has unacceptable consequences that surely we should uh, reject. Right? So earlier when I was explaining the idea of epistemic stances, I focused on what are commonly viewed as you know, philosophically, historically respectable interpretations <coughs> of the epistemic upshot of scientific inquiry. I mean, maybe you don't think that pragmatism is respectable, or maybe you don't think that neo-Kantianism is respectable, but you know, I'm looking at this in historical perspective, at the, uh, maybe you don't think that realism is respectable. Right? But all of these things are, I think, philosophically, uh, historically respectable interpretations of the upshot of scientific inquiry. <coughs> and um, realism, empiricism, pragmatism, etc., are all on the table in contemporary debates about how best to interpret science. But what about so-called practices of inquiry, in quotation marks, that masquerade as science? Like pseudoscience, or what I sometimes call pretend science, which is where you know, people aren't committed to a pseudoscientific doctrine necessarily, but they represent falsehoods about science, or they represent something false as science uh, to serve some sort of agenda. So these sorts of views, pseudoscience and pretend science, often present as science denialism when they conflict with, conflict with or are used to undermine genuine science. Here's the word. Doesn't a permissive conception of rationality open the door to all of that as well? If so, then that surely demonstrates indirectly that there's something terribly wrong with a voluntarist conception of epistemic stances. So to just put the concern in the form of a reductio, accepting stance voluntarism would entail, ex hypothesis, that pseudoscience is rational. It meets some minimal requirements of consistency and coherence. But surely that's an absurd consequence <coughs> for, uh, from what was supposed to be an account of scientific ontology. So surely an account of how we theorize about ontology uh, in the world on the basis of our best science shouldn't license that sort of epistemic malpractice. So just to sharpen up the question here, let me first clarify something that I think gets a little bit confused in some of these worries. Right? So 
pseudo-scientific theories, right? Astrology, uh, flat earth theory, homeopathy, um, those aren't stances. Right? They're bodies of putatively factual claims about the world. The target of concern here, in the first instance, is the epistemic stances underlying those theories. And so with that clarification in mind, the worry here must be that what we'll find upon examination, right, if we drill beneath the surface and try to figure out what attitudes towards evidence are being taken by pseudoscientists, et cetera, what we'll find is that the underlying stances pass the test of permissive rationality. In other words, we'll find that they satisfy the constraints of consistency and coherence. So elaborating on this just a little bit, I mean, we can understand those constraints as having both sort of logical and pragmatic dimensions. <coughs> um, logical in the sense that a rational stance shouldn't lead inexorably to forming beliefs that violate the probability calculus. That would be a sign that something has gone wrong. It also has a pragmatic dimension in the sense that a rational stance shouldn't lead inexorably to forming beliefs that are otherwise in tension with the attitudes and values and other commitments that constitute the stance itself. So if you're more empirically, empiric empiricistically inclined, right, if the policies that you've adopted epistemically are ones that lead you to have a lot of beliefs about unobservable entities, something has gone wrong right, um, in the way you're exercising your stance or the way you've conceived it. I think this is an interesting challenge for a lot of these what I'm calling hybrid positions now, like forms of instrumentalism that are kind of partially realist and partially instrumentalist, right? What are the underlying stances such that this all works out in a way that coheres with their attitudes towards what we can know? I think it's a non-trivial question. Okay, so I take it that um, it's this sort of standard commitment to kind of minimal constraints of uh, logical and pragmatic coherence that Stathosilos has in mind when he asserts, I think this is on the handout, yeah, um, creationism is not self-defeating. And what Ragnar van der Merwe has recently had in mind when he asserted that stance voluntarism can't exclude stances that license pseudoscientific practices like those found in Scientology. So he did a bit of a deep dive on Scientology. Poor him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I do think that these are serious concerns, right? But on reflection, I don't think that they undermine stance voluntarism. So here's why. I mean, for starters, it's worth noting that the devil is really in the details of trying to work out what stances precisely actually underpin pseudoscientific beliefs. That may be a considerable challenge. Um, in some cases, I suspect that the details may be partially or even substantially opaque, right? even to those who adopt them. And so revealing them is not an exercise that can be glossed over right? in the way that actually I think um, Silos and van der Merwe uh, have done when they you know, relatively casually suggest that advocates of pseudoscience and pretend science are generally you know, consistent and coherent. I don't think that's something that one can just say casually. I think it requires uh, some study of what the underlying stances are. So, for instance, while the relevant focus when it comes to scientific ontology um, is epistemic stances, that is stances whose function is to underwrite the production of hopefully warranted beliefs, it's plausible that in cases of pseudoscience and pretend science, other types of stances function to engender a kind of destructive interference with epistemic considerations. For example, um, someone who recognizes the importance of taking empirical evidence seriously, but who nonetheless overrides that policy whenever that evidence threatens to undermine, a, say, a favored religious dogma, right, such as creationism, well, arguably that person has fused an epistemic and a religious stance. Um, based on popular reporting, so I haven't done a deep dive on Scientology, but I've read a little bit about it. Right? <coughs> Based on popular reporting, something similar is apparently true of prominent advocates of Scientology, right? I mean, a polite way of putting it might be to say that they appear to have fused an epistemic stance with something like an economic stance, right? Their own economic self-interest type consideration. As such, these sorts of cases seem to be 
uh, strong candidates for cases in which uh, what we have is an exemplification of failures of epistemic consistency and coherence, and thus failures of purely epistemic rationality. In the absence of sort of more convincing evidence, <clears throat> I'm not inclined to grant that there are, in fact, plausible cases of pseudoscientific belief that are, one, underwritten by solely epistemic stances, and two, that satisfy voluntaristic constraints of rationality. But in closing, let me just, you know, for the sake of argument, uh, say, let's imagine the logical possibility of that right, and see what follows. It should be clear, I think, that there's no challenge here for a permissive conception of epistemic rationality that isn't likewise faced in equal measure by impermissivist accounts of epistemic rationality. Mm -hmm. Because in the final analysis, all anyone can do when confronted with a conflict between epistemic stances is to engage in a dialogue in which conflicting attitudes and values and aims and policies relevant to assessing evidence can be revealed and then compared and then considered. In fact, I think that's exactly what happens ultimately in debates between scientific realists and anti-realists. I think it's what happens ultimately when experts testify in courts about what differences there would be between uh, teaching evolution versus teaching creationism in schools. I mean, to add to this dialogue, you know, the assurance that I, not you, possess a uniquely rational epistemic stance, really adds nothing of rhetorical or persuasive power. So, you know, in contrast, to elaborate, to explain, to scrutinize, uh, to attempt to understand the nature of opposing stances, right, to engage in what in the book I call uh, collaborative epistemology, uh, and no doubt to encourage others when it seems as though our, our own stances pass the tests of consistency and coherence, right? Invite them to consider things, to see things our way right? upon reflection. Well, to do all of those things is just to do our best. I don't think that there's any insight into epistemic rationality to be gained by demanding more than that. Thanks a lot. Do you want to field your own, or do you want me to field? Take okay. it away, Charles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay, well, thank you very much, Anjan, for this uh, clear and stimulating talk. Um, I am wondering whether uh, the uh, uh, voluntarist epistemology, at the end of the day, doesn't have to rely on uh, some uh, reasons for belief in truth, because uh, uh, I think that uh, it's it's uh, right that uh, in fact uh, when people uh, adopt some uh, some positions they have some some commitments, but uh, uh, when they argue among each other uh, as to the better reasons better reasons to adopt uh, a uh, empiricist stance or a, a metaphysical stance, they say, well, look, this kind of strategy uh, 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 as. Uh, uh, Shown, has shown that there is less risk uh, of uh, being mistakes, of uh, being mistaken, or uh, uh, having to revise uh, my beliefs and things like that. So I think that uh, in the arguments, the, in the defense of a specific tense, uh, the people resort to uh, meta beliefs that they try to justify on well previous experience, I say, and typically uh, also uh, the ones who. Uh, defend a metaphysical stance, well, they uh, have to provide a justification for the truth conduciveness, <coughs> truth conduciveness of explanation, uh, something like that. Uh, and the ones who are empiricists, they typically van Frassen, and they argue that, well, uh, uh, inference to the best explanation, for example, doesn't warrant belief in the truth of statements. So they are meta belief in the truth, uh, or at least in the the efficiency of some strategies uh, of, of, uh, of a certain uh, way of proceeding to get to beliefs uh, about you know, science and things like that. So I think there are uh, 
meta beliefs, you know, justified meta beliefs that underpin the choice, the rational choice, a better uh, reason to choose one specific sense rather than another. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Michel. So there are, uh, I think, perhaps three really interesting things that I want to try to tease apart in your uh, in your <coughs> question. So are there different, are, th are there uh, uh, kind of universally shared aspirations for truth even within the kind of voluntarist framework of some sort or another? And then we can argue about, you know, what those are. Or different people may argue about what those are. I think, yes, there there is, um, although that in this instance is a fairly weak claim because I think all it suggests is that um, everybody is interested in um, the sort of uh, labeling the success, successful science, right? And then the analysis of truth may vary between different sorts <coughs> of people. So, uh, you know, a, a pragmatist may understand what it means to say their claim is true or uh, in a different way than a realist and so on and so forth. But I do think that everyone is interested in taking our best science as a starting point, and then they are concerned with then articulating what truths we can uh, pull from that. And then, that draws me to the, the second thing that I want to tease out, which is that I do think that you're right, that there are um, arguments that are offered to say, well, you know, this is why we should restrict the domain of truth to things like, say, empirical adequacy, because we run less risk of revision right, in the future. Um, it's been a huge part of the motivation, I think, for selective forms of realism to say, um, that's a genuine concern, right? The, risk, the risks associated with theory change are real. So here is, and then they would offer their preferred account, here's a way of thinking about the content of our best theories that makes it less likely to suffer the, that kind of fate of radical revision. So I do think people take that consideration seriously. And it can, now to come to the third point, um, take the form of meta-beliefs about um, uh, what sorts of truths are um, you know, warranted by our best science. But I think what I want to claim there is that while those seem like beliefs that are foundational, they're actually underwritten by the stance itself. Because I don't take those debates between someone that says, well, we should draw the line when considering risk at the, just at the stage of empirical adequacy versus someone who says, well, we could draw that line in a somewhat more liberal way at the, at the place where we feel as though we've used well-calibrated instruments to detect things that we can't actually see. Right? I don't think those debates about the risk of what might happen in the future and so on and so forth are conclusive. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to <coughs> the voluntarist picture in the first place, I don't think those debates are conclusive. If they're not conclusive, what's actually underlying those sorts of claims? And that's what I think are these, these more fundamental epistemic stances, which is to say, you know, I'm just not willing to take that risk because I'm just, I don't think it's so important that we have that kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, Super interesting, especially uh, the part of that discussion of the objections. Um, so I take it that there are several more or less strong versions of Stan's voluntarianism, and um, I think I'm still not quite sure where you would locate yourself. Um, so uh, the most uh, strongest version, the hardcore version of Stan's voluntarianism would probably be that stances are not app targets of rational justification at all. Um, so we couldn't make a difference between incoherent and coherent stances, for example. Uh, this is uh, something you would reject, I take it, uh, because you have these minimal uh, criteria of justification, um, coherence and consistency. Um, and um, so we get a version of um, stance voluntarianism where we have uh, stances as app targets, targets of rational justification, but several stances are equally justified given these criteria. But then we can have like different um, contentful criteria um, of justification. And here you would seem to take a quite minimal stance, only the um, coherence and uh, consistency, is that correct? Uh, because um, even if one would um, adopt more contentful criteria of um, justification for stances, uh, 
uh, we might still have like several equally justified uh, stances, and so we would still have room for voluntarianism, right? Because then, which one of the equally justified stances to pick is not a matter of um, rational justification anymore. And um, I guess what you would need for your analysis of the debate about realism is just that um, these specific different stances, like um, the epistemic stance and the metaphysical stance, these are equally justified given whatever criteria of justification we have. Um, and I would assume that even more contextful uh, criteria of justification that would, for example, exclude these weird stances that people have pointed out. Uh, but wouldn't exclude one of those stances uh, you discuss in your uh, analysis of the realism debate, um, yeah, would still be acceptable for you. Like, uh, yeah. So what would you say about that? Would you um, be ready to accept more contentful um, criteria of justification for stances than just, just consistency and coherence? So, uh, first let me say something about the, what you describe as the most radical, mm -hmm. most accepting position. I'm not sure anyone holds that position, although it is a position in the logical space of positions that one might hold, in part because if there were no constraints at all, uh, then it would be really difficult to make sense of these as epistemic stances, mm -hmm. right? as opposed to stances of wishful thinking or stances of you know, pure imagination or whatever. I mean, if there were no constraints, um, then I think it would be difficult to think of them in any sensible epistemic terms. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure anyone holds that view exactly. Um, but then, you're absolutely right to say that the criteria that I adduced, which were of course, I mean, I took this as going without saying, but I should say, you know, these were famously defended by Van Frasen, right, originally mm -hmm. in connection with the way he conceives his own empiricism. Um, and people have since then done a little bit more to spell out what pragmatic coherence may mean in the context of this discussion, mm -hmm. uh, in part because of the way Van Frassen discusses the criterion, um, it, can't, it can't be merely logical coherence, because stances are, to some significant extent, non-propositional. So it's not going to be something that you can merely constrain on the basis of some sort of logical coherence. It has mm -hmm. to go beyond that to some sort of pragmatic coherence, and then um, he doesn't really say very much, if anything, really, about what that is. He says a little bit, but I think others have gone further since to say what that might consist of. So you're absolutely right that I want to adopt that sort of position. So then the question you come to is, you know, would it be acceptable on this view or on, on my view to add more substantive uh, constraints? And the, the answer is yes and no, right? I mean, yes, it would be absolutely acceptable to add um, further constraints within the context of a particular stance. That's what people do, right? So that's what differentiates people holding different stances. They add more uh, substantive constraints, um, and that's what makes their stances distinct from others. Um, but no, not as a general criterion for uh, the rational acceptability of the stance. Okay. Right? Um, I think those, those criteria are just are going to be, by their nature, uh, quite minimal. Mm -hmm. right? And I think it's hard to argue for anything very much more substantive without then getting into the kinds of disagreements that the account is supposed to um, get away from, which is to say, well, clearly, right, and you know, sometimes I, f I feel their pain, right? Realists are arguing with an anti-realist and say, how can you not believe in, you know, this thing that I'm seeing under a microscope, right? I've like, here are 12 different ways we can detect this thing. Here's a preponderance of evidence, right? How can you not believe this thing, right? So I feel the pain, right? But at the same time, right, I do think that it's a consistent and coherent position to say, look, we need to draw a line somewhere about how far we're going to depart from what we actually see, which is a, an image on the screen. And that might be a place to do it, right? And so that's why I think that in the account of just what what would qualify as epistemic ra epistemically rational, right? The constraints are going to be by their of their nature quite minimal. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the interesting question for the you know the purposes of this conference are um, how maximal might they be? Right? I mean, how far are you willing to go? One of the things that I think is interesting about this particular case, right, the, the case of stance voluntarism in connection with the sciences, which is what I'm most interested in, is that I think that. Um, 
what's not at stake, as I mentioned before, are debates about uh, P versus not P, which I take to be internal to a, a stance. What we find is that there, that more and more speculative theoretical stances are inclusive of those that are more conservative. So everything that an empiricist says is generally something, all of those things are things that realists would accept, mm -hmm. but they add more. Mm -hmm. Everything that uh, someone who is a scientific realist, but also <coughs> believes very substantive claims about the natures of properties and laws and counterfactuals and maybe possible worlds, they believe everything a realist does, but maybe they add some more. And the question is, in the process of adding, right, how far are we uh, stretching the tether to what I've called empirical vulnerability and explanatory power? And where do we draw the line? Where do we think that the, that the warrant for belief runs out? Thanks. So, I'm convinced by, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that could just be my question. Um, I'm, I'm convinced by your responses to Pincock's objections. I wonder whether there is a different variation on objection one in the vicinity, uh, you know, not with, notwithstanding your, what I think is your correct response to objection one. And the idea is something like this. Um, so stances are supposed to be values and attitudes and commitments. Mm -hmm. And now if I reflect on, can I choose my values? Uh, can I choose my commitments? Can I choose my attitudes? Well, I guess psychologically I have a little bit of control over that, but for the most part, like, the control that I have over that is fairly minimal, right? Uh, it seems that the extent to which we can choose our values, uh, the kind of deeper commitments, not superficial commitments, but deeper commitments like we're talking about here, seems like if we can change it at all, it's not something that we can easily change. And this seems to be in tension with the voluntary description of how we take stances. So, uh, so given that, like, I, ho I hope you see the relation to the original or relational objection. I was hoping I could just invite you to say a little bit about what you think about that version of the objection. Yeah, yeah. So, that, I think, is, uh, is very insightful in a way that I think is helpful to me uh, because it allows me to say a little bit more about what choice means yeah, good. in this context. Right? So, you know, we have uh, in everyday natural language use, I think we mean different things by choice. Right? And some choices are more easily made than others. In this context, I think it means something quite specific. Um, describing um, this in terms of choice is misleading in at least a couple of ways, right? One of the ways in which it's misleading is that I think often people operate as epistemic agents without reflecting on their underlying stances at all. They may not even know, right, why it is that they think, you know, their two scientists are arguing about the implications of the data from their last experiment. And one of them says, yeah, we're ready to publish. This is a result. And the other says, you know, we just need more data. I just, I don't, like, I'm not feeling it, right? It's not, we're not there yet. And then, but in that case, is it obvious that the underlying epistemic stances that are, you know, perhaps separating them, right? Leading one to a kind of judgment of agnosticism and the other to a judgment of belief. Is it clear that that's something that's uh, transparent? Uh, to either, probably not. Right? So the idea of applying the term choice to that context seems strange if it might not even be obvious to them what precisely their underlying stances are and how they differ. Yeah. Sometimes I think it takes a lot of work to actually understand what's going on, right, and why people are led <coughs> to make the epistemic judgments that they make. So it seems weird to call that choice if it isn't even transparent to the choosers. Uh, and then the second point I think is the, the one you made, which is that, well, even if we were to do that work and to you know, fully understand right, our, our full epistemic lives, right, what's going on, uh, that uh, it isn't as though we could, again, not flip a switch with respect to belief, but flip a switch with respect to our stances, not just, oh, gee, you know, 
maybe now that I know the way I think, maybe I will be a logical empiricist instead, right? Yeah, okay. it, doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. So I do think that choice has to be understood here in a very particular way. And the way it has to be understood is just in terms of there being other options. That qua epistemic rationality, um, you couldn't be faulted for taking. So there are, there are, there are possible options, right? um, but you're drawn towards one of them for the reasons that have to do with you know, things that could be illuminated when we articulate your stance. You're drawn towards one of them. Right? And that will determine how you choose. Right? But a lot of this is, I think, as you say, it's under the surface. Is it amenable to change? Well, I think it is. And a lot of what uh, we're doing in philosophy when we illuminate what's going on underneath the surface is having these discussions. That's why I said I think that ultimately arguments even between realists and anti-realists uh, come to a point where people are displaying their underlying epistemic stances. And I do think that over time those kinds of conversations can be uh, you know, motivating for people to say, oh, you know what, now that I see it, I kind of, I see where they're coming from, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I feel like maybe I, I'm drifting a little bit in that direction, or otherwise some people stick to their guns. So I do think that, I, I don't think it's the case that those kinds of discussions are, are immaterial or lack potency when it comes to uh, the stances people adopt, because I think that people can be convinced or they're, you know, they can change over time. But that's not, that shouldn't be surprising because, you know, uh, our values can change over our time. Right, the things we take to be important, the things that the amount of epistemic risk we're willing to take may change over time and from context to context. Um, so yes, I want to agree with everything you said, and I think that the the word choice in some ways is misleading, um, but properly understood, I think, fits within the voluntarist tradition. Yeah. And we should distinguish psychology and philosophy. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> That's what you do. When you speak about the notion of choice, it's not a matter of psychological notion. It's a rational, rational choice. Right. To what extent is rational? So yeah. That's, that's philosophy. That's, that's true. Although the reason I, I, I joke about it, maybe half joke about it, is that, you know, it is ultimately, I mean, this is a, something at the heart of the voluntarist tradition that. You know, ultimately, what is it? I said that you're, you have a bunch of rational options, right? but you're drawn towards one of them. Right? What is that? Uh, now let's try to cash out the metaphor. What, is that, what does that mean? Why am I drawn towards one of these or another? And that, within the voluntarist tradition, is often described in terms of something that I think we have to take as primitive, at least in this analysis, and that is the will. Right? And so is that a psychological notion? Or not. I mean, this is, uh, this is something I talked about more in Berlin. I mean, some people say, look, in order for this to be a compelling account, what you need to do is some empirical psychology to, uh, you know, to understand why it is that some people go one way or another. And I'm skeptical about that myself um, because I, I'm not convinced. I think that there are lots of things that might be interestingly naturalized within epistemology, but I don't think the nature of the will, just to put a, a label on it, is something that we'd get very far in trying to analyze in psychological terms. Um, so I'm very much with you that I think it's a philosophical question. So we have 15 minutes left, but we also have five questions on my sheet, so Nina. <laughs> Thanks, so I wanted to ask about the difference between assessing stances and assessing people's reasons for adopting stances. And I was thinking, that um, focusing on the, the latter might give you some more options in responding to the pseudoscience worries. So I was, when you put the, the list of like respectable stances up on the slides, and I think about, so I think uh, the different people I know that adopt different versions or different uh, stances on that list, many of them I think adopt the stance that they have having fully considered the other stances and maybe yeah, being drawn, just drawn toward one, but having fully considered everything. But I do think that there are people, even you know, working in philosophy of science, who adopt one of those stances essentially because they inherited it from their dissertation supervisor or something like that. Sure. Um, and sometimes, I think when we're sort of arguing about stances, what we're arguing about is 
hey, I don't think you fully appreciated my stance or given it full consideration. Um, not that you have to adopt it once you do, but that you need to go through that process in order to sort of be doing it right. And then the thought was that maybe that can help with the pseudoscience cases too. So I, you said something interesting about the Scientology case and that being like an economic stance. A slightly different way of putting that maybe is like they're adopting a stance that qua stance meets the minimum standards, but their reasons for adopting that stance are not the right kinds of reasons. They are economic reasons or maybe in some of these cases it's certain kinds of social reasons or things like that. Right. Yeah. So thanks a lot for that. A lot of um, really interesting things there that I'd love to unpack a little bit more. Let me, um, let me say something about two of them. Uh, so one, with respect to you know, how does it people end up adopting the stances that there are? So I don't think that, uh, notwithstanding that I said maybe the, the ultimate nature of the will is inscrutable, right? Uh, notwithstanding that claim, I do think that there are things that, that could be illuminated about why people uh, adopt the stances that they do. Maybe they were influenced by a particularly inspiring supervisor. Maybe they wanted to adopt a position that was the antithesis of what their supervisor adopted. Maybe they, you know, there, there may be interesting social, cultural, sociological reasons that acculturate people in certain ways that those stances are more appealing to them than others. And I do think that, you know, we might be able to say interesting things about that. I'm sort of taking uh, for granted the idea that, and perhaps this is an ideal, well, it is an ideal, that as philosophers, right, we may then subject our positions to a kind of critical scrutiny <coughs> that ultimately, to some extent at any rate, uh, will push those kinds of uh, uh, acculturating factors into the background as we subject them to the pure light of our reason. Right? Now, <laughs> but then my, my claim of the fundamentally inscrutable nature of the will will come back. and so. Um, but so I do think that we can we can do things like that. Does it help with respect to uh, you know the pseudoscientists and so on and so forth? I'm I'm not sure. So I do think that you're absolutely right. It would help to find out like what are the reasons, what are the stances, and so on and so forth. But then I think we may come to, and this is I think a point of difference between the stances that I describe as the philosophically and historically respectable ones, and maybe some others. The philosophically and historically respectable ones. Are, are ones that take empirical evidence seriously. And that's kind of a shared, you know, that's a datum that, that is shared across these traditions. It's one of the reasons why uh, I'm comfortable talking about them and one of the reasons why I call this a, an account of epistemic stances. And my worry is that in some of these other contexts, right, a conception of what counts as empirical evidence gets skewed in like very interesting ways. Like, you know, is, is private revelation evidence it's not intersubjectively available, is it not? I think there are interesting conversations to be had about what will then count as evidence and how it should be uh, you know, treated and what weight it should be given and so on and so forth. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that when these other things that I was saying, well, maybe they're not purely epistemic, but uh, they're economic or they're social or they're political and so on and so forth, depending on how broad a conception of pragmatic encroachment you may be willing to go along with, those might be, might be considered epistemic. Well, thank you very much. And I will, I, I will address that last point. Yeah. I have a, a, a question, it's two part divided about the identity criteria for our stances. The, the, the first one, it's related with the notion of stance, and the second with the notion of epistemic stance. And, and you mentioned at the end of your talk, um, the uh, deep disagreements um, and maybe uh, debates on realism can be characterized as deep disagreements arising from the adoption of conflicting epistemic stances but also debates within I don't know say the metaphysical stance can be also characterized as deep disagreements you mentioned your own discussion with studies about loss of nature and maybe debates on the metaphysical nature of laws, say debates <coughs> between humans and metaphysical and nomological realists can be also characterized as deep disagreements having the same characters, the same features of the, as the um, realism debate. So, so can we say that we have 
cases of deep disagreement within the metaphysical stance, for example, or should we identify different substances in that in those cases? And the, 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 the second question points to your last com comment. Um, how can we identify those epistemic relevant factors to consider a stance to be an epistemic stance? Because in, 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 in many philosophical traditions, social, political, and maybe economic factors are uh, essential to the production of knowledge and should be considered to be epistemic in some way. Good, good. So first, with respect to deep disagreement. Um, so, you know, deep disagreements, for those of you who haven't delved into that literature, are, you know, disagreements that are sufficiently deep that the, the fundamental underlying disagreements may not be resolvable. There's some question as to whether they can be resolved. You know, Wittgenstein suggesting that some propositions are ones that we cannot conceivably doubt with, and otherwise we sacrifice our inquiry altogether, right, so on and so forth. So ones that are sort of taken at, at face value as, uh, uh, as a requirement of our discourse. Um, and people may disagree about those sorts of things. So deep disagreements, I think that they can occur in different places. So you could have dis deep disagreements about stances, right? which is ultimately a disagreement about what you value and what you take, you know, how much epistemic risk you're willing to take on or how epistemically risk averse you are and so on and so forth. You can have dis deep disagreements about those things. But you can also have deep disagreements within the context of a stance. So if people are arguing about laws of nature, right? I take them to be operating with what I call the same epistemic stance, right? Because they think that the evidence is sufficient to allow you to go one way or the other. Um, but I'm, I'm skeptical about the resolution of all dis deep disagreements in those contexts as well, because you know, one of the chapters of the book, I look at um, structuralism about uh, physics, and what I ultimately argue is that the different positions here, these, all people share, these people all share a stance in the sense they're arguing about different conceptions of structure, right? Um, ultimately, these accounts ground out in certain primitive notions that you just have to accept or reject. And there isn't that much more to be said about all of them are slightly strange, right? Often primitive notions are that way. You just have to take it or leave it. And, um, we might draw different morals from that. We might draw the moral that, well, maybe this debate isn't resolvable. Maybe we should draw the moral that, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about these different accounts in terms of truth, but rather in terms of pragmatic, a pragmatic conception of what kind of description of structure is useful <coughs> in different contexts. Um, but I think deep disagreements appear in all kinds of places. Right? So they aren't tied necessarily just to stances. Um, and res with respect to your last point about um, about broader conceptions of what might count as epistemic. I certainly think that everything I've said here is compatible with the idea of augmenting it in that way, but I think that's a substantive question as to how far you should. Yeah, and I won't say more about it now because I know that there are other questions. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Anya, for your presentation. Um, I was uh, wondering how much for pluralist are you? So Sorry, how much? How much for pluralist? Yeah, how far would you endorse pluralism in this uh, regard? Because I am very fond of what you say about empiricism, instrumentalism, uh, the metaphysical stance, and so forth. Uh, but I get a sense that at some point pluralism stops. So when it comes to creationism or scientism, uh, you will say that well, empirical vulnerability or expansion power will work as criteria to separate things. Uh, whereas uh, other philosophers, and I'm thinking of some time or Stephen will will be David will be they'll say well uh, let them in uh, yeah uh, and let them crash with evidence and let them try to sort <laughs> out you know uh, their lives and so forth uh, so my question here would be uh, yeah where, where, where do you stand in this uh, you know uh, <coughs> uh, in which, which, what point so yeah. yeah so I'm uh, I'm definitely a pluralist of a, of a sort. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly a pluralist in the sense that I think there are uh, different 
underlying epistemic stances that are rational, right? So I'm a, a pluralist about uh, the scope of, of rational stances. Not our, every stance will be rational, but there's more than one. Right? I certainly think that. Um, but, right, having said that, um, I do think that, you know, we have to be careful about how we describe how we feel about these things. I'm a pluralist at a kind of meta level of analysis when I look <coughs> at all these stances, right? Uh, I'm not thinking about myself as a possessor of one of those stances. I'm thinking about how we should think about, um, you know, it's a metaphilosophical question, how we should think about these things. But then, when I descend to the ground level, right, I'm a sort of scientific realist. And I take certain kinds of evidence to be <coughs> compelling and to lead me to warranted beliefs about various things. And right, so, so how uh, um, inclusive and how exclusive I'm going to be with respect to what I take to be the right thing to say will depend on whether I'm you know, telling you about what I think about the meta level debate as opposed to what I think about the ground level debate. Um, that said, right, I, I'm not even sure what it means to say let them in. I mean, uh, you know, you could go so far as to let everyone in where there are no constraints at all, right? Make something up, uh, you know, a counter-inductivist uh, policy that you associate with mm -hmm. that stance and let them in too. I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, the, the sciences are not things in which we make decisions about whom to let in. Uh, exactly, right? I mean, now we're, we'll get into conversations that are interesting about the social institutional nature of science. And some people will be let in and others won't. And it's an interestingly, perhaps historically contingent fact now that people that don't take evidence seriously in the way that all of the people I said are philosophically and historically respectable have, right, are not considered scientists per se, right? If they were, then I might have to say something slightly different when I'm giving an account of scientific ontology. But I am taking for granted, right? Um, so, you know, talking about pseudoscience and, and pretend science in a way is taking me beyond the domain of people that I took myself to be talking about when I originally gave this account. Because it was supposed to be an account of scientific ontology, mm. right? Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm happy to be drawn outside of that domain, right? Um, but I do think that there are some things that are shared um, and a certain respect for scientific practice and its ties to what I'm calling empirical vulnerability, right, is not something that's disputed within that domain. But it is disputed beyond that domain. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, many thanks for talking to you. Really um, many things you said gravitated around the notion of evidence. Um, I was wondering if you think that there is a unified concept of evidence. Many of the dispute that you, you were showing in your presentation are people, for example, creationists and sharing with the scientists, but probably they are they having a different concept of evidence. Many personally think, for example, that the, the Bible is evident for them, and so they are following the evidence in the sense that they are following the Bible. And when some people say, okay, like uh, Chris said before, uh, let, let it in, in our view, okay, but we are going to also share the notion of evidence that they, 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 they are having. I mean, we are, how we are going to compare the evidence? Uh, Again, I mean, my, 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 my question going, to, to going down to the point is that if you believe that there is a unified council of evidence of people who disagree about what they mean by evidence and there are many other notions of evidence and, and so on. Yeah. So one thing that I don't do, haven't done, right, and I don't have a very good answer for you now, is to give a fulsome account of evidence. I think there are some people in the room who could probably give you a better uh, answer to the question than I will uh, right now. That said, I do think that we have some you know, paradigm examples of forms of evidence uh, that are with good reason taken seriously within the context of the sciences, whatever stance you may adopt. Right? So for example, and I do enumerate some of these uh, in the book, I talk about, for example, uh, the use of novel predictions as a kind of probe for empirical vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. um, domains that generate novel predictions that can then be tested whether an experiment or observation or otherwise, right? That's a kind of empirical vulnerability that, generally speaking, is taken quite seriously as something that uh, has weight, serious evidential weight, right? Or uh, what I call degrees of experiential distance, right? which is a way of talking about how closely and how well connected we are causally to the things that we're investigating. Right? How mediated is our contact with the things that we're investigating? Uh, 
considerations like that are important to assessing the weight of the evidence. So I do think that we have paradigm cases of what would constitute good evidence, at least within the context of the sciences, but the broader you know, landscape of possible sources of evidence that you're talking about is something that I haven't really tried to systematize. Okay, thanks. With my apologies, Alex, would you love to pose your question during the 20 minute coffee break, which begins presently. So thanks again for a great talk and I'm <laughs>